Hello, welcome to my garage. My name is Reed Parham. I'm the VP of Programs for the Bonsai Society of Portland. I've got an Engelman spruce next to me, but that's not the topic of today's program. So please let me introduce to you Scott Elzer. He's a local commercial artist, professional graphic designer, and a bonsai enthusiast. He's studied under Boone. He has won national, regional, and local awards. He's a kind guy, he's accessible, he's precise with his communication, likes to teach people. So right now, the Bonsai Society of Portland is doing a series of live events that we'll record and post on our YouTube channel. We'll send out those links in a variety of locations, so keep looking for us. That really matches our ethos for how we make ourselves welcoming, accessible, and really take note that what comes first is the appreciation, education, and perpetuation of bonsai as a art form, cultural practice, and a community where people can come together. So take a look down below. I've got some timestamps, chapter notes. You can skip ahead as you need. Don't worry. Take in only what you need, and uh, please enjoy. Thanks. So anywhere that I cut where there's a leaf, I'm going to get it to grow there. It's not going to push down at these other leaves. If I want it to push at those other leaves, i got to cut it there. So it, instead of pushing right now, it's going to make another uh, bud at that site. But crab apples in particular are very reliable in this sense. That's why I like to use them. Kind of fun. So uh, tree and refinement, just like pruning, keep everything in check. You can see that I have actually um, <clears throat> tilted here. You can see where I cut across leaves. There we go. You can see the different leaves that I've cut across when I partially defoliated it. And it just keeps on pushing and keeps on pushing. So some leaves that are big, I, I partially defoliated. The ones that were small, I did not. But all the new ones came out smaller. And the more I do it, the smaller they get. Mm -hmm. uh, Tree and refinement. Your notes say be sure to leave stuff for blooming. Oh, I'm glad you mentioned that. I, I didn't bring in the, uh, the tree that has um, the apples on it, which I should have. So most, most fruiting trees, uh, let's say uh, pears, apples, plums, they make uh, flowers and fruit on the, on the short spurs that are at least a year old, and that's what produces the flowers or fruit. So you might think that you don't need that little stub, but that's actually what's going to produce the fruit next year. So you've got to get, at a shohin, it's really a challenge to get the tree built up to where you start getting those stubs to where it will flower and uh, reproduce um, uh, predictably. So you don't want to prune those little guys off. That's where the flowers are made. But obviously when you're, you're sh I'll show you these other trees that we're going to talk about. And that's the sergeant crab apple, right? Uh, I think that one is. It might be the hoopa hensis, but these are sergeants that I grew from seed. Oh, okay. So I know what they species. are. I know what these guys are. Gotcha. And many of you have some of these. Uh, I wanted to show you this one that Reed brought in. If it's hiding somewhere. Well, I think it got left out on the driveway. I think, I think it's outside. It's like, <laughs> <laughs> so I wanted to show you these, these guys. So uh, differences in some shoots here. Are we in a short camera? No, you're out of line. Okay. Which you can see those pretty good. You can see the color too. So uh, three, three crab apples. Great trunks on these. Uh, this one here, I believe, was the... The stump was pruned last um, fall. And these have been allowed to just grow and grow and grow. It's very stiff, very th thick. I wanted to show you how to wire. This one's almost past wiring. It's so stiff and so thick. But they've been just allowed to really grow to help um, build a transition. And uh, by, by stubs, like some people might also know those as, as fruiting spurs? No. Oh, uh, like stubs of two-year-old wood, maybe. Yeah. Okay. You're out one. <laughs> I'm going to see if I can point out this. So it was cut into a little stub. 
And there we go. You can see it. I rotate it. You can see where it was stub cut right there, and then it's, it's branched out either side from there. So I can come back and clean those up. So this is the time of year that the tree is putting on vascular growth. So now is a great time to go back and clean those up. Why don't we do that? Got my handy knob cutters here. And your deciduous soil mix, is it different, uh, different between the maples and your crab apples? Well, the biggest difference between the maples and crab apples right now is depth. Oh, depth of, of, depth the, of, the, of the growing media. Okay. But they wouldn't be that much. What I would use for potting soil is not that much different. Mm -hmm. But I would tend to use about a 50% Akadama, 50% lava, and 50% pumice. I've done some experiments with 100% Akadama and had mixed results. And it's more expensive. So I'm probably, there might be a few things. One thing I can tell you, though, one thing that has had 100% universal result is planting things in boxes for development only. You can't refine anything in a box. It just wants to grow. But uh, that's one thing that's made a big difference. You mean, uh, like, you mean a training box? Training box. You yeah. might be a little confused about 50, 50, 50, because that makes one fifty. Did I say 50? Yeah. I'm sorry. 50% Akadama, 25% pumice, and 25% lava. That's why you have me here. So it's, yes, half lo half Akadama and the rest <laughs> comes in lava. The math checks out. Yes. Scott, you're going to talk about pruning. Go for it. Yes. So when I have these stubs, it's a great time to uh, take care of this. Uh, I'm not sure where we are. We can see this. I think next time the screen has to go where <laughs> right towards the camera. So uh, I'm just going to, so I have this uh, stub here. I'll just say, this is the stub I want to cut off, and this is uh, the branch I want to keep. I want to cut this straight across here. I don't want to try and taper it, taper it down this way. If I do, it has a chance to die back down this far. I want to cut it across here. This is skinny. This is thick. This is thicker. So but I cut this off straight across, make a nice clean cut, put cut paste on there, and over the years, as this thickens, it builds up a shoulder here, and you don't even notice that it was ever cut. But if you, if you try and cut it, make it really nice, especially if you have a really big difference and your, your branch is too small, it's just going to die back. Happens a lot with Japanese maples, not so much these crab apples are pretty durable. But um, uh, that's what we want to do. And I like to use a little knob cutter, which is the round cutters. I'm too round. you in wide or uh, close. Okay. You wanted that, I think. Yeah. We'll get you there. So that I'm glad this came up because this is a great time to do this. Mm -hmm. Okay, you see my stub right there. That's what we're working on. We want to clean that up. So I left the stub so that I wouldn't get dyed back. And if you look real closely, you don't see much of it here. There's a shoulder there. And you can see where the tissue is receding. It's kind of shrunken. So you want to cut just above where that little hump is, where you have live tissue and it shrinks down to dead tissue. And I find these concave cutters are actually knob cutters. So now I'm seeing I'm getting some live tissue, and that's what I want to do. You can see that little bit of white there. That live tissue is what I want to see. But I want that all the way around. And because I cut the stub earlier and let it die back on its own and I didn't dictate where it was, it gave me that nice green tissue that now I can come back and cut it nice and flush. And I'll have to cut paste it later. So you can see that dead core in the middle and you see the sapwood nice and green. That'll heal over real nice. So now that we're in here tight, just say that was cut paste. Actually, I'll grab some real quick. That's what's nice about being in your own garage. You have all the supplies handy, right? Ooh, Scott has a mix of cut paste. I see the <laughs> yellow tube. <laughs> you got the you got the putty stuff. You, you pulled that out. Okay. So the, my basic types of cut paste. Yeah, people are super curious about types. Yeah, so this is uh, uh, 
Cut the pesto. <laughs> <laughs> Literally. <laughs> they <Literally>. anglicized it. <laughs> so, um, oh, you're in on the uh, detail cam. Okay. Where are we at? There we go. There we go. The yellow tube, that's all you have to remember. So this stuff is um, more of a, uh, a liquid slurry. It kind of separates and stuff. But this is really great for using for uh, conifers. Um, thing. It has some uh, hormones in it, and it dries to a um, stretchy, flexible type of film. But it won't stop bleeding. But really, my favorite um, cut paste is, now this is putty, really cut paste. Um, actually, this isn't, this is what's, I get confused on the names. This is what you usually see in a little jar. Mm -hmm. You hold this up. But that's more like a clay. This substance. is like a clay. You can see it has a little sponge to wet your fingers if you put some water in it, and you can see that uh, it's the little putty right down there. This is what I actually use on 90% of what I do, and especially all my deciduous trees. And would you give me a slight counterclockwise rotation on that tree? Yeah, there we go. Here we go. So you can see that. I don't have any moisture, so it's a little tough. And, and that with my fingers, which you're not supposed to do. Do you expect that stub will die back, or or is that going to be a point of transition? In this is my final cut. Okay, I could get it a little closer, but the reason uh, I could probably work work it down just a little bit more. But what I wanted to do was to put a little piece of wire on that for you. So here's what's hard: is that this guy is too stiff. I'm only interested in the first couple of inches, but I'm going to wire out a little farther. I'm going to leave that in place. But this branch here is much thinner, but it's still pretty stiff. So what I've got to do is to hold things very still as I apply my wire. And especially as, as that thickens up, that looks to me like a nice, familiar interesting deciduous uh, uh, turn like that'll really develop some character within it. Okay. Right. So I'm glad you said that because what I want is I don't want a deciduous turn. I want a crab apple turn. Ah crab apple. So Excellent. think of crab apples as as Arnold Schwarzenegger of the deciduous world as the bulky guys. Um, they're kind of rounded, gnarly, bulky. They're not slender and fine like a Japanese maple. So they have a little bit different character. So I'm holding this very still so that I can use this extra thick wire that I need for the other branch to wire this one also. And I make my turns a little bit tighter because I'm trying to put movement that I can keep when I prune this back. So I'm gonna leave this wire on. Notice I haven't pruned the branches because what I want to have happen is I want uh, the growth of this entire branch to thicken this area and set that. And it will do that in a couple of weeks this time of year. So now I can control this. I can get a little bit of movement into it. And again, I'm really only after the first inch or two in the final, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wire six inches. You know, it helps me shape the rest. And who knows what, what might happen that I might actually save that and use it. And what you're particularly doing there with your right hand looks like is supporting the branch union so you don't like rip it out. Right. Okay. I'm get, yes. And then you'll notice that the wire's nice and tight, but I'm supporting with my offhand whatever's happening. So what I really needed to do, the reason I needed the wire was to change the angle on this branch because it was almost straight up. So now I can get that going out a little bit more. I've got some really nice buds, short buds in here. So now I can get some more movement into this. In most of these, these trees, the trunks were not wired. Uh, it's a story for another time that I've told before. Um, I did that accidentally, but got some great movement. But now I have to use wire to get some of that movement and get some of that crab appleness into things. I do some of it with pruning and some of it with wiring. So now, have we got a good view of that? For our back we out back. line. Okay. Not sure why we switched, but... Um, you want me in close? Yeah. No, that's okay. 
Uh, we'll move on. So uh, this is what's important so I get this leader in this, the right shape before it starts thickening. And so that I can start healing this, uh, this branch over. Really great. The, the bark here is actually starting to break up a little bit on this little guy. These are like 15 years old from seed. So uh, also, I decided some of this comes down to practicality. Uh, you can see how long this guy is here. I let him grow to help thicken down here, but I decided that I don't need that thickening anymore. And in the winter, and it's hard to keep uh, these all in storage and everything, and the wind wants to blow things over. So off it comes. But I left plenty of buds here. Um, I need to, I've got a little shoot down here that I can use to help heal the scar that's there when I go. But at least this is out of my way for the next year. But I have plenty of things to help the tree thicken right here. So, I got off on a little bit of a tangent there. This was this year's spring original growth. It was not wired in uh, May or June like it could have been. This tree was pruned in May, and this is the resulting growth. Now, this growth is about an eighth inch in diameter and is perfect for wiring right now. Because if I wire it right now, it's going to set right in time. And I also have another stub here to clean up. And it's been enough growth here, and these branches are strong enough that I can go ahead and take care of that. Nice, tight, little, I've got two or three curves in three inches. Nice little shogin guy going there. And notice the color on this one is much yellower because I pruned this just a month ago, which was really a bit late. And, but it has put on some great growth, and I could actually go ahead and wire these they're very tender, I would have to do it very carefully, I need a lot lighter wire, but I could wire these into position so they would, they would set. But it's actually, all of these are from the same seedling batch. This one has a nice, a nice thick trunk and this is uh, progressing very nicely. So, that's what we have. For, oh, I even use, so you don't have to wire everything. I don't know if you can see this, there's a little piece of bamboo right here. I'll get you in close. Like I said in the chat, next time we will have an actual, real, button-click video switching. <laughs> Alright, wh where are you at? Right here. So instead of putting wire on there and, and the possibility of scarring, I just cut a piece of bamboo, the same that we use for uh, repotting, holding things and making chopsticks, and I rounded both ends so that they would kind of lock in. and. So there we have, I'm going to tilt it towards you a little bit, you can see that. So this branch down here is what I'm pushing away from the trunk. You can kind of see it in there, get my hand out of the way. So that works pretty well. And then here's the one that needs a little wire. I'll do this one too, so you can kind of see the action. Uh, a little bit of pruning here. I've got a branch that's on the inside of this curve. I don't really want to do that. Leave it there because it's going to fill in everything. So I'll take that out. That was right there that I took that out. So now we've got these two that we can wire together. And I can use the next size wire down from what I did last time. This one I can get a nice turn on the trunk to anchor it. And your right hand is, yeah, there we go. So I, I start here, I held very tightly as I um, wrap this wire around. Now I've got kind of a start. I'm pinching, notice I'm pinching those two together so that nothing can move as I wrap this nice and tightly. This is about the minimum size wire that I could use to bend this branch in the kind of curves that I want. So my pitch here, you know, most of the time, like we're doing conifers and things, the pitch on our wire is maybe 60 degrees, usually greater than 45. When I'm doing small shoheen like this and I want to get some nice curves, especially on a deciduous tree, then I'll go ahead and go back to about a 45, just so that I can get more movement in between. And you can tell maybe why where this was growing, all the branches are growing in one direction, so that's what I've got to fix here. 
You've got to spread them back out. Here, Maybe my hand's not in the way too much for you. Now we can get some serious movement and just go slow. Don't worry about whether the wire is on the inside or outside of the curve. Just take it slow and more, more worry more about whether the bud is on the outside of the curve. That's what you really need. You know, and this time of year, any little cracks, it can patch it. And again, I'm only going to use the first inch or two of, of what I'm doing now. But this will help it in the future. I need leverage to be able to bend into shape. So I'm helping you with the time check. Uh, it is... Very nearly eight. And Doing good. Yeah, sounds good to me. So you can see I've got a little bit of movement in there. All set to harden up this this fall and uh, rock on. Okay, just a few more deciduous spots before we uh, take some breaks. Two trees here. Actually, these are both native trees. One is a mountain ash, and one is a gary oak. And both of these have what you might call sacrifice leaders. Uh, people also call those, what, escape branches? Escape branches, different things. So, but there's a little bit of difference here in the two. Uh, I'll take this one that's actually growing in a smaller pot. This is my little trick to keep it from blowing over because it had such a big top. And it did work. It did not blow over in the storm that we just had. So here's the challenge that we have. Just like one of the other maples there, that I'm growing a shohi here. And no, it doesn't look like it. Shout out to Tom Walsh who, who uh, gave me this tree. But if I let this thing rock on too much, it's going to take over the part that I really want. I really want the strength back down in here. So because I don't want this to blow over in the middle of winter, I'm going to cut this thing back now. Now I can, it'll recede and I can choose a better place uh, in the future, but I actually um, want to get the strength back down towards the bottom of the tree. And right now it's getting too strong. And do you really, really want us to see where that escape branch uh, meets the trunk? Uh, no, okay. that's not important. I can show you this. You can kind of see because I'm not taking it all the way down there. I'm just reducing the, the strength of this guy right now because you can see he's most of the tree. Has a great trunk with a little bit of movement. God, are you at all worried about the scar size yet? Or when you do finally take it down? Uh, that's a great question, Lee. I'm always worried about the scar size on deciduous trees because some things heal. You know, this is the only mountain ash I've had, so I don't know anything about them. It's got an interesting smell now that I've cut it. And, um, but I know that on my crab apples, that uh, even in the ground, I could not get them to heal over very well. So uh, I'm very, I never let the, the scars get above a half an inch. Okay. Now, I may have better technique now, but even the, it was surprising me that I couldn't get them to heal in the ground. And I've got some new techniques to try to, to make that happen. Um, so, I'm just going to do that and let the rest rock on for now. But I just wanted to take that. that um, I'm not trying to induce back buds. That is why I cut that. And that's the difference between this tree. Is that I have the back budding that I need. I'm not trying to get a flush of growth on the trunk. I've got the branches where I need them so I can safely cut that back and know that I'm doing well. This uh, oak is a whole nother question. So I just repotted this tree uh, this year because it became it came from nursery stock. 
So uh, I wired it. Um, you know, oaks tend to have the reverse taper, and I was a little bit wary about what it would do. One interesting thing that I've done different than the rest of my deciduous trees is that I planted this in a really coarse mix. So I eliminated all the fines because I knew that oaks like it a little drier. When I watered the rest of my deciduous trees twice a day, I watered this one once a day and it sits out in full sun. And the results are fabulous because these leaves are a really nice dark green. It's obviously very healthy. But uh, since I repotted it, I'm trying to rebuild the root system. So if I cut this back now, I, I repotted this ash tree a couple of years ago. But I just repotted this one. I'm trying to rebuild the root system. If I cut it back now, I'm limiting how well it can do rebuild that root system. Plus, I wanted to get some strength back into here, some, some back budding. So the best time to prune a big, thick trunk like this and get back budding is going to be after it's hardened off in the spring. If I do it now when the sap is receding, it's likely just going to stop and I won't get the response that I want. It won't kill the tree, but I'm not going to get any back budding, so I want to wait uh, to do that operation. So this tree all, tonight is all about when to step on the gas pedal, when to step on the brakes. It's like, what are we trying to accomplish? How do we use our fertilizer? How do you know, if you notice uh, when we had all the smoke, my trees started using a fraction of the water that they were, and they pretty much continued in that mode. They really shut down. So I've been watching that closely and not watering too much. Um, but uh, we have to remember what we're going for with the actions that we're taking. So that's why I'm trying to show you trees in development and trees in refinement, trees in different stages so that we, we can take appropriate action for what we're trying to do. So Scott, to clarify, when you say harden off, what are you referring to? Well, hardening off I'm referring to, it could be any time, but I'm partic in particularly talking about the spring growth, the first flush of growth, as it comes out, it's all nice bright green and gets a darker hue. The leaf physically gets harder, the cuticle on it is forming, and it starts to use less water, and it's actually starting to pay back all of the um, uh, resources that it used to grow that leaf. It expended a lot of resources. It's building up those resources right now. These big solar panels are taking in energy and storing up in the roots and in the um, the, the vascular tissue here, energy for next spring. Next spring is going to grow and, and use that energy up. Now it'll have some in reserve, but it will use that energy. Now is the time where it's really building that back up again. But in the spring, after it's shot out, gets a brand new set of leaves, it, it, it needs to harden off to where the tree can actually provide, use those leaves to provide energy for itself to, to back bud, to respond in a positive way. How do uh, oak soil contribute to like the gas and the brakes? Are it, is it a drier mix, a more coarse mix? All I can tell you is what I just told you. Yeah. Of what I've done because this is the first oak I've ever had. Yeah, I, so I, I can't one tell as you. Well. <laughs> but I have, you know, um, I did read somewhere that non bonsai related that you know they like to be drier, which is that's where they grow. Uh -huh. And so I thought, well, why not? Why not take that coarse, I mean, that fine particle out and let it be a little coarser, just like I would a white pine or five needle pine in, in the conifer world. I'm doing the same thing. Just like a ponderosa pine, I water my ponderosa pines if I can stand it once every three days. <laughs> it's really hard to not water it really more. And um, uh, uh, that's to keep the needle short. It doesn't need any more water. That the, I'm keeping my pines too wet, and so I'm working at keeping them drier. But this, this tree, you could, it has a really rough texture, um, really thick leaf, and it's got that kind of Mediterranean feel that's just, it's tough, and it, it's made for harsh climates. So it, it, it um, I, I need to relate to that to, to get success, I think. And it, so far, it's, it's doing well. After that repot, it was like touch and go. I, I got to do everything I can to save it. OK, that's all I have for deciduous trees right now. Do you want to take a break, or do you want to keep on going, sir? Uh... 
That is a great question. Break wheel and the squeaky brake. <laughs> At least feeling good. How is everyone on the stream going? I see people. Oh, Daryl's giving me a thumbs up. Kevin says thanks. George is leaning in. Everyone's everyone's good. All right, we finally have everything rocking, so let's just keep going. Okay. So now we're going to jump into conifers. Thank you. So I, I hope this kind of loose overview is helping you um, on what we can do in this time of year, from September into fall. So what I didn't really explain very well is um, the relationship when I want to talk about early fall and later fall. So early fall depends on the species. If we talk about Douglas fir, they have a switch that flips from um, uh, foliar growth to vascular growth in July. That means essentially their fall is starting in July. And that's why we, repr we prune them to take advantage of the tree while it's in that in-between mode to get it to generate and activate the buds that we want. Uh, some trees, some of these deciduous trees, they're in their fall mode, but they're far from being done for the year. So, and we know that ponderosa pines, they don't finish growing their needles out until September. So we've got July through September to where fall starts for different trees. So we have to know some of those nuances to be able to take advantage of them. If we fertilize or water too much in the ponderosa pines before they hit that hardening off period that we just talked about, then the needles are going to get longer. Um, so that brings us to, well, so we have early fall and later fall. So a lot of things we do, if it's early fall, that the tree's in its early fall stage, like some of these Japanese maples, if we give it a hard prune, I know I have one in my, on my front porch, if I prune it now, it'll just shoot out again. So, because it's in a little bit protected area. So we don't want to do that to our trees unless you have a purpose for that and you can control it. Maybe you want to get, use that to get shorter growth and you have time to deal with it, that's all fine. Just want to give you tools on how to deal with things. But um, the latter fall is where things are fully into vascular growth and when we prune, they're not going to revert back and do um, uh, brand new growth. They're not going to push new foliage. So that brings me to junipers. And um, this is a Itoagawa juniper that I grew from a cutting. Um, can you get me in a little tighter? Mm -hmm. Just because I think you guys would enjoy this. There we go. I just want to show you. So I wired this when it was thick as a pencil. And you can see that trunk. Let's see. A little bit of fun stuff there. So this was grown in a, in a round terracotta container uh, for many years. And I noticed that the junipers, they just love to be underpotted. Um, they, they just rock out in these tiny containers. Like, you can't possibly hold enough water. Well, they love heat, and they love um, these kind of conditions. So the fact that they love heat means that the best time to work on them is when we're just getting into heat or when we have really hot heat. So the best time to work on a juniper is um, in early spring, just before it grows, or in the middle of summer, like July, when it's raging hot. And I was all set to work on some of my junipers, and I had my uh, carpal tunnel surgery right there. <laughs> and my hands are healing well, that's great, but I lost my window to work on my junipers. and so. The strength of the junipers is in the foliage. So what I did is instead of styling this tree last fall, which I could do, uh, I wanted to repot it into this tiny little pot. And it was in it was in one of these. Oops. Get used to where the camera is. You get the idea. There we go. <laughs> My hand's in the way. It was in this pot right here. So I had to get a lot of reduction in the root ball there. So what I did is I didn't do any work on this. I need all this foliage to help me regenerate new roots when I got it, when I cut most of them off. Okay? So that's what I did. Now why you see this piece of plywood is because I have this planted so far over and not styled yet that the foliage weight would tip the whole thing over. So I just have it wired to this 
little tray. But the whole point of this is, is that we're pretty much out of season for junipers to be pruning foliage. That doesn't mean you can't do some wiring and things. And this is a shimpaku, or a version of shimpaku. These are much stronger than our native um, junipers. So uh, native junipers like the um, Rocky Mountain juniper, California juniper, they're not near as strong. And so doing a heavy prune and wire this time of year is not very advisable. You want to make sure that you can protect them because it would really affect their cold hardiness if you take away all that foliage. Remember, all the foliage that you take off, you're reducing the amount of energy that the tree has um, that it's able to store for next year. So anything that you prune right now is going to affect that. Is it going to make a big deal? Maybe not. Maybe you don't take that much off. But if you do a 50% reduction, you have to think about, am I going to need to protect this tree during the winter? And if you can, fine, do that. But if you can't, like I can't, I don't have any, uh, I don't have a greenhouse. Everything is out in the cold. And so I have to be careful of what I do. So you're going to leave those runners on all winter long, correct? Um, probably. Now, I can, this has so much foliage that I don't have any problem pruning this back. I just don't want to take, it, when I style this, I'm probably going to take 75% of the tree off, at least. Yep. So, but I, I have confidence now that it's been, look at it, it's just going crazy in this little pot. So I know I've rebuilt the root system, and now I'm ready to do whatever I want when I'm ready to. Very if healthy tree. Point. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, for me, these little guys, they're like, I don't know what I did, but it worked. <laughs> so, really That's inspiring. inspiring. <laughs> so, just start, so, yeah, inspiring. So, start now. Start with a rooted cutting that's this big. Well, essentially, you <laughs> just slam a juniper into a tiny pot, huh? This, this would be really fun. This is a little fun exercise. Can you zoom out a little bit? Yeah. Unfortunately, I don't have a piece of juniper foliage for you guys, but I'll just show you what I did. Good, I'll get some nice black wire so you can see what it looked like. Okay, here we go. So, this is taking the place of my juniper whip, okay? So, I have my wire, copper wire, got to be copper because we're going to be making a lot of bends. So, I wire this out. Okay, and then I start to make my bends. You know, I'm making, uh, I always want to go in the same direction that, that the wrap is going when I make my bends. But you'll find like, it's like, uh, as much as I can, I can't get the coils as tight as I want. Okay, and this is all I can do that the wire will hold. I got, I got this kind of spiral here, it's not the best. I want to get some other direction in it. I do a little bit of stuff. But this is what I did with these junipers. I take this whole thing. Because I can't get the wire to hold the tight small loops that I want in a shoheen. I take and I just mash the whole thing together like this and then wrap another wire around it like this to hold it. Of course, if this was a real branch, it'd be springing back. So it looks crazy, but it worked really well. and gave me the kind of things that you see coming out of Japan, if that's what you want. It looks kind of crazy for a while, but that's it. So I get that, I get this convoluted back and forth on, on top of each other, which would be impossible to do any other way. That's exactly what I did to dozens of them this year, and every one of them sold when I had my sale. People <laughs> loved it. Yeah, so you can do that. And I didn't do the best job that I could have, but it, uh, it came out pretty cool. Let's see if I can show that a little bit better. You can see there's some kind of movement. I have some dead wood going on. I'll rotate it around a little bit. So this is going to be a semi-cascade, obviously. The thing to do is, the best, the best hint I can give you is to wire everything and leave lots of trunks. Because what do you like about junipers? You like dead wood. 
There's nothing worse than having this beautiful curved trunk and having straight stubs for deadwood. So it doesn't look right. So you want to make sure that you wire plenty of things. You can cut them off later if you don't like them. But do as many as you want. And uh, I have one tree that's pretty strange because I have two trunks that are kind of intertwining like this around each other. It's kind of like two branches that ended up uh, convoluted. So anyway, that's my little tip for today, how to make great shogi. And uh, most of you watching are plenty young enough to do that. Here we go. Are we still here? That's right. There's what I'm talking about, curved deadwood. Every time I, I get thrown off by the screen. Curved pieces of deadwood. There's more down there. So make plenty of branches. We are valiantly, valiantly learning new tricks here. Yeah. So this little guy, he kind of, kind of looks like the guy in my shirt there. Huh? <laughs> Do that, yeah. Anyway, um, so this is a redwood. So I want to talk a little bit about redwoods. I have pinched and pruned this thing like half a dozen times this year. It just continues to go, and I'm like, why in the world am I fertilizing this guy? Because he's, he won't stop growing. So uh, this came from Zach Scheiman, of course, uh, at one of our conventions. It was like everybody was packing up one day at the end of the convention, and I went over and picked this guy up. And um, I almost lost him one year because I had him underneath the eaves and didn't get enough water. But um, uh, what I want to point out, I'm getting some really great ramification now um, following the uh, Ryan Neal's um, tips on Mirai. Uh, but you want to think about these redwoods as sort of a Mediterranean species, and so the timing on these is quite a bit different. So they really set their buds up for next year, about November. And they also they have a period in the um, summer where they do that also. And when you see the little green um, nubs start forming, the little uh, buds forming, that's telling you that you can prune and it will generate new buds right at or near your cut site. And that's what you need on these guys because they just like to grow and elongate. It's an elongating species. We'll turn this this way. You can see the foliage a little better. You can see how much uh, I'm trying to, not sure if I can get a good right here, this one. Shows quite a bit of back budding. I got the yellow of my shirt there, though. We have a lot of um, small branches coming up. The thing is that they're not, it's back budding in places that are not crotches. It's getting the kind of back budding that you really, really want. And, and it buds, it's budding right where I cut. So I cut this um, a month ago. And uh, it's, it's just continuing. I have to keep pinching. Look at all this growth. It's incredible. They keep going. I think I'm insane to try and grow a shoheen redwood. Here's, I don't know if I can get that right in here. There you go, focus in. So you can see all the back buds down in there that's happening on this guy. <laughs> it's the autofocus, I guess. Yep. Yeah, all kinds of buds in there happening that I can cut back to and I'm able to get this ramification built up, get it compact and make something reasonably uh, nice out of a, a small redwood. It takes a little bit of work because it wants to pop out everywhere all over the trunk with suckers and uh, um, but the timing of the pruning is critical. And then when it grows out to an inch or so you can just keep on pinching and it will, it will uh, keep producing new foliage. What's next on our list, Lee? Oh, Japanese black pine. Oh, Japanese black pine. I brought the small tree in for that one. We're going to need the close-up camera. I eventually. <laughs> it's been nice, uh, especially when I go into the detail cams, people have been getting a, a subtle sneak peek of what's lurking in the background. <laughs> Woo, here we go. Hey, the little guy. <laughs> oh, he almost works there. I just need to move this one out of the way. <clears throat> I 
Okay, so this one is here for lessons learned. Oh. And uh, you want me to pull out a strategy? Little? Sure, to give people a good look at this guy. Actually, why don't we pump him up a little bit? That'll help. Oh, you got one of those fancy things. Yeah, birthday present from my dad. He decided that uh, he did not want me to suffer the same fate as his back. So he got me this guy. That's because I have a ramp that I have to haul my trees up <laughs> and everything. So, uh, plus put, putting them on the bench. So, this is Japanese black pine. Uh, most people have seen this tree before. It won the best of show in, I think, 2012. So, quite a while ago at the U.S. National Show. I have decandled this tree every year for the last 15 years. And it started to get weaker and weaker. And the, it was rocking on so hard that this, this uh, soil mass was just rock hard. And I was having a hard time getting water into it. I had to keep water, keep water, keep water. And it wasn't percolating through. I scratched the surface layer off and it still wasn't helping it. I had a little trick that I tried. I think I told this to Lee. I took my drill, quarter inch drill, and I drilled holes into the soil. <laughs> I stopped if I hit anything like a root, but that actually allowed the water to penetrate through that solid mass and get something going and get it through the next year. But um, I'll have uh, a read switch to the, uh, the detail cam in a minute after I do a little bit of talking. Um, but I want to show you why I didn't decandle it this year. So first of all, I did a highly detailed uh, restyling and I cut a lot of foliage out. When I did the styling, I was planning on decandling it, which meant that I would most likely get two buds at every site that I decandle. So I'd only have so much room. After years of having a quarter inch of growth and doubling that, you can tell that just very quickly there's no room for any buds. So you have to start eliminating some of them. Well, I eliminated a lot knowing that I was going to do that process. And then it was like, oh, well, I really, really need to repot this too. That was the number one priority. And so um, I did get it repotted in the spring. It was one of the last trees I did because the black pine is native to down like southern Japan, like Okinawa and stuff. It's a coastal tree, it's not a mountain tree. And so it doesn't like the cold here very much. So I left as much foliage on it as I could. I repotted it. I put it on a heat bed that I made. It was an outdoor heat bed, but still it had something to help it uh, recover. And uh, I'm very happy with the results, but we had a really cool spring, if you remember, and I was really worried about the tree and along, you know, my deadline gets to May 31st and it's like, I can't decandle this thing. The needles are a quarter inch long from last year, uh, some of them, maybe up to a half an inch. That's like nothing. There's no strength left in this tree. It's all depleted. So I can't decandle this. So I just let it go, and it still wasn't growing, it still wasn't growing, and then finally it just took off and it just started raging. So now I'm at this point where um, I've lost the needle length that we look for on a showable black pine. It will take me a couple of years to get that back. However, now that I'm in this place, so I'm not worried about needle length because I let it grow, I didn't decandle it. Now I'm gonna fertilize the heck out of it so that I can get the tree healthy and strong so that I can decandle it next year. So I'm using this opportunity to really get the strength built back up over the entire tree. And if you look, I worked very hard at getting the density even when I wired and styled it. And even though I didn't decandle it to adjust the, the strength, you can see that it has come out um, better than I would have thought. Um, balance of strength, there's a bud everywhere. Um, forming, which on every single branch has a bud forming, which the dead didn't always happen. And so I'm um, very, very happy with the work uh, and the way that things went. But the lesson there is if you need to have the tree recover, take advantage and really pump it up. Don't just say, well, uh, you know, it's out of refinement now. Uh, it's a tree, it's a recovering for a year. Then it's back in development and hit it with fertilizer, hit it with water. I, it's incredible. I have to water this thing. Um, twice as much as any other pine tree because it just there's so much foliage mass even though I cut most of it off it still has regained all that 
I have to really, uh, the black pines really like a lot of water, so we have to do a lot there. But this is a multi flush pine, if you've heard that term. So we're going to cut the candles in the spring. We are in right there. Right there. Okay, I'm going to cross the camera real quick. So you can see right here, see if my finger's in there, boop, how short those needles are from last year. Incredibly short, and how long. So they're like two and three inches um, this year but these are half an inch and less. But you'll notice that things are starting to turn a color here, so we can just pull all these out. They're gonna fall out anyway, but I can clean things up. If I want to wire, now is a great time to come back in and wire any of your pine trees if they haven't been decandled. If they've been decandled, uh, that means that they are still hardening off. You notice that there's at the base of these, it's slightly yellower than at the tips. Even though I didn't decandle it, it's still not fully hardened. It hasn't fully changed color. So if you want to know if you can wire or not, if you have decandled, if you can tug on the needle like this and it stays intact, then you're probably good to go and you won't do too much damage. But you always want to be careful of that. I would recommend leaving as many needles as you can if you can't um, uh, provide protection over the winter on a Japanese black pine. I just found much more success if I leave uh, as many needles as I can over the winter and then come back in the spring and thin out the needles. I know a lot of information from the Japanese has you, uh, and some teachers has you thinning out the needles. You can do that if you have protection, but here it, it seems kind of risky, and my trees are outdoors. I've never had a problem with this tree overwintering, but, um, and, and that's what I've done to do that. So uh, anything you could think of to add here? You covered it all. No, I thought you did real good on that. Good. So, um, just wanted to show you on something that's mature, refined. It, sometimes we just have to kick things back and do something new. Um, let it recover and give it a new style. Um, here, this is great. When, the, when this tree was in the national show, there was a big branch right here. <laughs> that's gone now. And the tree's so much better for it. Now the tree has a more um, deliberate movement to the left, whereas before it was to the right. And so, um, and yeah, so taking advantage of this really old, massive uh, branch here that really shows age. So very, very happy with that work. So I'll back this guy up. Scott, did you have a uh, timing or, like, when do you decandle here in Portland? The best... The all-around good time is um, the last week of May. Ooh. The last week of May. So, without going into that, because I'd have to draw on the whiteboard. And... Sure, sure. Decandling is one operation where you have to work backwards. So maybe I'll just explain that. So we know that our growing days are numbered. When we get to October, the black pine is going to stop growing, as most trees will. So if I only have that much window to grow, then I've got to work back how much time do I need to grow the length of needle that I want. So if I'm growing a big tree like this, maybe I want longer needles. If I'm growing a shohin, maybe I want shorter needles. So if I need shorter needles, I need a shorter growing time and I decandle later. Maybe it's just a couple of weeks, but it can make a difference. So a big trees, you decandle first, Small trees you decandle later. But I find that I need to, I've decandled in the middle of July before. I mean, it worked, but the results weren't great. And, and that was probably on this particular tree? Uh, probably, yeah. Okay. <laughs> I've decandled so many times that, I, you know, it's... And uh, what I do when I decandle, I should explain, is that I, I usually needle pluck and prune. I uh, could wire also, but I haven't really done that on this tree but you uh, uh, thin out the needles to balance the strength. And so that's an important part. So to do this tree when I have a couple hours in the evening <laughs> takes me all week. Oh yeah. <laughs> and did you mean to say mid-July and not mid-June? I said I have done that. I do yeah, okay. not recommend it. Uh, of course not. Okay. Just it's when it was sure. like it got out of hand, but it's like if I don't decandle it, it's going to be worse than if I do. Yeah. I, Does that make I, sense? I, I get it. Yeah. It, it, yeah. Although just... I, I'm rethinking that a little bit because this thing got so low, 
energy, but th I'm really glad it has recovered. You're on the red pine now. Yep. So uh, another, uh, or pretty much the other multi-flush uh, pine species for us is a Japanese red pine. And I grew a bunch from seed, and I really like Japanese red pines. And you can see that I put some wire this and put some movement in this. We had some workshop uh, last year. And so I saved some of the ones uh, that I wanted and, and did some work. This is my favorite trunk out of all of them. So uh, I decandled this tree this year, believe it or not. But I only decandled one branch, and that's why I have it here. So this is to show you that even though you decandle, you don't have to decandle the whole tree. So the reason that I did not decandle the whole tree is because I have um, these branches right here. There are no back buds on this whole thing. You see that? Yeah. There aren't any back buds, although they're starting to develop now because I left all of this foliage. So leaving all of this foliage here generates health and vigor and vascular strength, which gives rise to back buds. And I have a few on branches here. So once I get the buds back behind here that I want, then I can start decandling. So I have this small branch that maybe you can see here. I don't know if we can zoom in here. Do you want me on the detail? Yeah. I need you to slide the uh, turntable back. That way? Uh, back toward the backdrop. There we go. Cool. No. My fancy switcher. <laughs> I'm getting good at this. <laughs> hey Lee, you're doing excellent on the audio, by the way. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Right. Okay, there we go. Now see how bright, bright colored those, that foliage is? And see how short those needles are? This branch was decandled, and that is because the length of here, that where this branch is, is very short. That's an inch, and they got another couple inches here for the next buds. So that meant that the short, the growth was short enough that I could already decandle that and start building a nice fine branch. This is going to be sort of a literati style and I want narrow, short branches. And so that's what I'm working towards. But these other coarse needles, you can see how long they are and branches are not really working. So I need to leave this foliage on, let it rock on until it gets back buds and then I can cut it shorter. There are some back in here that I'll be able to do that next year where I can decandle. Actually, if I move this right here, you want that? There's yeah. A bud right there, two of them actually. You may not be able to see them. So uh, it's producing back buds. Scott, I have a question: um, oxens and removal versus leaving the oxens to create vigor to get the back buds. As normally we've been told, remove oxens; it allows it to back bud. And well, you have yeah. the vigor. Right. So, um, oxens do, uh, I hear <laughs> conflicting result, uh, conflicting explanations of exactly how they work, but functionally, they're at the tips of the branches and they, they stimulate these branches to grow more and uh, retard the other branches mm -hmm. of back budding. Aside of when you reduce the oxens by cutting this tip off, which we do often in bonsai. That allows the cytokinins, which are more about branching, to take over and produce back buds. But what really gives rise to budding is um, vascular health and productivity. Getting the highway moving a lot of resources, and the tree says, Oh, I've got this much foliage and I've got this much energy. I can make more buds because I can support all those buds. So then it starts to back bud. But if we continue to cut back the tip, it will never get strong enough to produce back buds. Now, we'll get sharp growth out here, but I want it back inside here. In fact, some of these branches are almost already too big for what I would really like. And it hasn't really developed the cork cambium, the part that where the bark gets so thick that it can't really produce a back bud. It hasn't really happened yet, mm -hmm. so I hold out on that. 
That was a good explanation. Thanks. And where I haven't got those, I resorted to grafting, in arch grafting on a bunch of these, mm -hmm. which was marginally successful, about 50 50. Um, but if I'd have used the growing method to grow them more vigorously and get the back buds, I think I would have gotten better results. So that doesn't mean that I can't wire and style this. Mm -hmm. That just means that I'm going to leave all this foliage. I want to get, I want to wire these branches down, get them in a position, get movement before they hard thicken up too much. Your notes say this is a really good time to wire the Japanese red pine. Yes, any pine tree is a really good. This is the second best time of year to work on any conifer right. except for junipers. So here we have the tree that. My wife has named Liberace. I just love that name. <laughs> so that's pretty much the she front. Calls it Liberace. <laughs> What's that? Tell yeah. them why. Oh, yeah, because the, you know the other name for Bunjin is literati or literature, based on the same word, same root word, and she kind of likened it to Liberace. So yes, literati. So anyway, um, so this is an Engelmann spruce, so a native tree. I've had had some problems with. Uh, I think Rhizosphera, which I didn't get sprayed soon enough, so I lost some foliage here on the tips. You'll see some of that. Um, but uh, this is a spruce elongating species. We talked about one elongating species with the redwood, but this is really quite a bit different. So I'm trying to go for a very light alpine feel on this tree. And it has grown. I did, I did some adjusting in the uh, early summer with the wire. Um, and did a little bit of pruning so there's not as much to do on this tree. But now is a great time to come through, check your wire, see do I need to add a piece of wire to do some shaping or can I do some pruning? Now with, with a spruce like this, you can prune back to any place where you have two buds. We talked about other deciduous trees. Same thing with conifers. I don't want to prune back any farther than where I have two buds or I have too many branches. Now, what you'll notice often on spruce, if you've done some pinching, is that there are no buds where you pinched, especially on our native species. Some of the Japanese species will, but uh, they won't predictably bud where you pinch. But what they do is they activate buds behind that. So you have to do this a couple of years to kind of get ahead. But once you do that, you'll see these ends here. They don't have any buds on them. If I have um, uh, side shoots that have nice buds, then I can prune that back um, and eliminate the stub that doesn't have any um, uh, back budding on it. However, if the tree is, now this tree is accumulating a good amount of foliar mass, enough that we've actually pruned it back, um, eliminated some branches, and continue to evolve its styling. But if you have a tree that's still in development and you need more uh, uh, ramification, you need more health and strength, then even these pieces that don't have a little bud on the end are actually providing nutrition for the tree, as long as they're not turning brown and crumbly and things like that. They're actually helping the tree out, so it's better to leave those on than to just prune it back. Um, but we can do that. And also, I come back through, and uh, I have a branch here. Oh, okay. Where did we go? I thought you were picking it up. <laughs> Carry on. Oh, no, no, no. Where's it best for me to work from? Here. Well, I was able to get you in on the bud that kind of uh, goes out to the right, right uh, just below that. Here? Here? Just a second. Yeah, there you go. Yes. You got some buds there. Okay. This bud's for you. <laughs> ah. Okay, so Reed, in his infinite wisdom, points to the one part of the tree that I didn't want you to see, which, oh, is, shoot. <laughs> which is a part that is basically dying back. There are some buds here. Oh, I was going to have buds that, that were just above that, but carry on. Where are we at? Yeah, right here is fine. So this is, this is the work that we do this time of year, so this is great. So now I've got a punt. I've got to say I'm losing this branch or it's not worth investing more time in because I have other things other branches. So I just am removing this wire. I'm untwisting it. I'm not taking it off. So one big thing I've learned from Ryan is to uh, maintain my time investment in wiring by reusing as much as I can. And so some pieces of wire may stay on a tree for quite a few years if it's not cutting in. And I just add wire. 
uh, where needed or remove it where it's cutting in. So now I've used this one wire that I just took off and putting it on this other branch. It's a, the wire gauge is much heavier than what I need, but because I have some pliers and I built up my skills a little bit, I can do that. And now I can prune back this dead piece or dying piece. And I have a much finer piece of ramification that has two buds on it, although it's losing a few needles. And now I can adjust that to work with the rest of this. So that's a simple type of work. Now I have lots of tips out here uh, on other parts of the tree. Yeah, what do you where, want us to see? Where uh, we can add wire. I had a place that I wanted to do, and I'm not going to see what it is. The rhizosphere really hit this thing pretty hard. I've had a couple that have done it this year, too. Okay, here's a place where I can add just a little bit of wire. Actually, so what I want to do is to do as much as I can without wiring. And that's the goal. These are really, oh, up here is where I really need to, to add some wire. So this is, this is where the strongest part of the tree is. On a spruce, this will be incredibly strong, incredibly thick. If you don't watch out, it will just, the wire will just bite in and it will, the pieces will just take off. So I'm bending those, tree, those branches down. You see how they are? They're not pointing up, they're pointing across. So I'm doing that to take some of the strength out. What Lee was talking about the oxen. So we're going to put a little piece on here so we can get a little more shape, a little bit more movement, and I can add some right in there. So we'll, add, we'll just add a little bit of copper because that's what we're dealing with here. Scott, how are we doing be, on time? This would be a good time to talk about needles that you can take off and that you can't and why. Okay. Prepping it for a wire. Yes, so I think you can see this maybe. So when I'm, when I'm here, all I'm going to do is, you, my hand's in the way, I'm sorry. I'll try and do this from here. I'm just rolling my finger across there, kind of smudging them, so to speak. And if they come off, those are the ones I take off in preparation for wiring. If they don't come off readily, I don't force it because the tree is still using those. Now maybe in a few weeks they'll come off, but I don't like to make little tears. I used to do that in spruce. The spruce bark will easily tear if you're not careful. And we're doing good for time. It's 8.45. I, th I think your outline will carry us through pretty close to yeah. 9. Good. We'll just put this one piece of wire on and then we got one tree to talk about. And... That means it's almost midnight in Ohio for Kevin. <laughs> I don't think he minds. I take out any growth that's in the crotch or any place that I can't really use. I know we have some friends from North Carolina tonight as well. Oh, that's yeah. cool. Ooh, Boston? Ooh, look at that. That's nice. Kevin doesn't mind. Kevin was going for a beer earlier. Especially if he chose us over Ryan tonight. That's pretty good. <laughs> nah, he, had, he has both open. Okay. <laughs> Technically savvy, huh? I tried work competing with Ryan tonight. I almost sent, um, oh, I forget her name. Shoot, I, I almost sent Mariah an email saying, whoops. <laughs> I told him that we were going to be doing streams and he can add two and two together, so. It's all in love. Are you still going? Yes, ma'am. Um, come on in. The, the name of ever... Liberace yes. is Mariah. Yes. And here she comes, Miss Liberace. Hey. hey. He doesn't have the camera on, so you can. Yeah, so this is what the the stream is. Cool. This is my wife, Lisa, that you're hearing, maybe. No, I, uh, I figured out some audio tricks, and the background noise should, should mostly be gone. Okay. So what I do when I get out towards the end, I didn't do a really great job, is uh, I coil the wire loosely around the needles so I'm not crushing them. I don't want to crush them, so I, just loosely around there. And I'm trying to create an acute angle here between these two branches. But notice I did not put any wire on this one. I do it with just one piece of wire that I can go and shape. And I've got this other one, same thing. One piece of wire to wire two branches and shape it just by twisting. So I take an... Give the camera here. So if the branches are like this, I use the wire to twist and make them both level so that I only need one piece of wire to do it. Let it do the work for you. And I can't say I styled it. 
Oh, we all know you did. <laughs> Question is, is, are you okay with what he just did? Oh, okay, you're in trouble, Scott. <laughs> we are checking with Lisa for consent. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> There's like one needle missing, she notices. <laughs> okay, so um, great time this uh, great time of year to work on your elongating species. The reason why is if you can get this work done in early fall, we talk about early and late, and even somewhat late, if you can get it done in early fall, the tree has time to patch any damage and you get the wire to set so you can take it off. So it's building tissue right now, so you want to take advantage to have it wired. If you take the wire off, put it right back on because um, with a spruce you want to really take advantage of it because it cuts in really soon. There's only one species that cuts in faster. Ah, ah, ah. Here <laughs> faster it comes. than spruce. In the blink of an eye. <laughs> Drop roll. <laughs> That would be a, a mountain hemlock. There we go. So some of you may have remembered when I brought this tree, you can see the weeds here. Sorry, I haven't been able to get all that. Um, you may have seen this tree when I brought it in a year ago with the pot. It wasn't in the pot, but the tree was... Um, in its original pot, sitting at an angle in this weird plywood contraption to hold it in this new position for a year or two while it recovered from all of my wiring and, and everything. And then I could repot it. Well, finally this, this spring I got it into a new Sarah Rainer pot. Um, love the look. It really fits it. I love the fact that it's in an American pot. But this tree is great. Mountain hemlocks are great. Now here's a um, western hemlock. I'm going to show you the same thing. A close relative, this is reeds. Western hemlock. Notice the foliage difference here where we have um, a brighter yellow or green, blue or green here, at least in this area, um, Mount Hood area things, the, the foliage on a mountain hemlock is greener. This uh, foliage on a western hemlock tends to grow out flatter, where this tends to grow out all the way around. Uh, reeds is a little bit of both. It kind of fooled me for me too. Uh, but um, both hemlocks, when I'm looking at it reads western hemlock here, there's a bud every quarter inch. So you can pretty much prune anywhere you would like to on these trees at this time of year. Now, this tree is in refinement, and uh, what's nice is that you can use whole pads and just lay them out. Um, but you can see where some of these are maybe getting a little strong, a little long. I don't really want to have to wire them. So I can just give them a little snip and I can do it just about anywhere. So the key is finding your bud. Once you find a bud on any tree, and you want a pair, uh, so you keep the ramification, but once you find your bud, you can prune any tree. You're safe. Any time of year you see a bud. It doesn't really matter. That's really probably the best thing I can give you tonight is that you can do a lot of work anytime you want, pruning anytime you want, as long as you have a bud. I didn't realize it really was in close. Snuck in on you. Yes. So um, you can't see this area very well. The area is a little bit thin. I need to let this grow and elongate and fill in and create uh, denser but more refined um, pads, more distinct pads is what I want to say. Um, but I'm very happy with it. I took this tree to the brink. It doesn't look like much in the picture you see. We can see the front a little bit more, but it's out of, out of No, I got range. you. I got you. <laughs> um, but uh, when I styled this, I eliminated a lot of branches. There were way too many branches, you know, like five in one spot. That's what I mean by too many. And just making knots. And there are even big scars here from uh, the previous owner and probably even me, where we left the wire on too long and it just made big gnarls, and I just had to cut those knots off and, and redo some things. So... Um, but I took this, this tree absolutely to the edge, thinning it out, um, getting it wired, and uh, it responded beautifully and predictably, but the key was to not repot it after I did the styling. Let it recover, let it tell me when it was ready. Even though I had this beautiful pot to put it in, 
it wasn't time to do so. Um, and that's the key for right now that I wanted to mention. It's a good way to kind of wind everything up. I mentioned this with the juniper, but before you do a lot of pruning on any of your trees, and this kind of goes for deciduous, but mostly it's for conifers, make sure you know what you're going to do next spring. Are you going to, is it a collected tree that's the first time you repotted it? You're going to need all of that foliage mass to regenerate new roots. So you don't want to prune it right now, you want to save all that. I know I've seen Ryan get nursery stock that he knew he was going to repot it. had this, you know, this enormous amount of foliage that you were never going to need for the bonsai, but he needed that to generate new roots because he was going to take it from a pot this big down to something like this. And so the opposite of maybe what you saw in books is you need more foliage when you're going to have less roots. The tree will work out the difference. We needed the solar panel to generate new foliage. So be careful of what you're going to do next spring and let that kind of guide what you're going to prune and how much work you do um, this fall. So, any final words of wisdom that we have? I Let me see there are still 58 people on this, this screen. Yay. Oh, that's cool. And I popped them over here for you to see it again. Uh, yeah, but I'm looking at the screen, that's why I'm looking at it. <laughs> but yes, carry on with, with any final thoughts. Uh, Scott was leading that way. Yeah. I thought you did a great job covering it. Good. I mean, I know that that was a lot, a lot of species, a lot of different things to talk about, but just want to give you some tools to approach the season. We can't get together. You can't even get with your regular teachers, maybe, but something to help you get you over the hump and, and get you through the season uh, as we move on. So. Yeah, I think that's, that, that's, that's exactly it. A lot, I feel a lot of appreciation for uh, seeing people's faces, uh, I noticed people eagerly like signing into Zoom and like clicking on the link that we had sent out. I am delighted to see some enthusiasm and uh, it's good that all of these things work and we didn't blow out any circuits. Uh, <laughs> so I, I, I think we're headed toward doing this in uh, October and November. Cool. I, and find it, I find it very funny that we were working on the sound right up to the last minute. 30 <laughs> seconds. <laughs> Before we started it, Reed pulled it off, so three cheers for Reed. Yes. So I'll yes. read back to you. Really nice job, everyone. Thank you. Clap, clap, clap. Thank you to all of y'all. Um, and people are feeling good about it. So that sounds good. I'm going to end the stream if I have managed to locate where the heck that window went. Oh, there it is. <laughs> All right. Goodbye, everybody. Good night. Anything muted. Have a good night. You did really well. Good. You did really well. I mean, you certainly have a lot of content. It's like you had this memorized. You know, I mean, I, I write those up and I still have to pick them up. Well, that's part of the memorization process is writing it up. Of course. You know. Yeah. But... No, that was thank you, Lee. Smooth. Oh, that was fun. Whew. Yeah, that really did uh, come down to the wire. <laughs> now, even though Scott is impressive, accomplished, and stands out, the Bonsai Society of Portland has many others like him. I'm really just humbled to stand amongst giants. These people are welcoming, friendly, and inviting. There are many other people with awesome experience, awards, background in bonsai, community contributions, and professional accomplishments. This really is a group of people who come together, find, find our mutual strengths, and grow bonsai here locally, push it out regionally, and now here on the internet, we're hoping to reach even more people. Even though the BSOP is well-storied, impressive, adequately funded, and has a variety of impressive professional contacts and partners, we really need you to get involved in making bonsai sustainable in your local community. I would love to see you putting time and money into your regional and local bonsai groups. You can push them to advance. BSOP through no small accident, has ended up like this. So, time for some technical notes. We're recording in full HD. This is the sort of audio quality you could expect in the future. 
Um, this, this lighting is uniquely well set up here. We are committing to really advancing our technical game. Right now, I'm just a, an AV committee of one person. I welcome other inputs. I have some background in professional media production, development, design, but I'm just doing this as a hobby. So go easy on me. We welcome constructive criticism. I would love to have you join forces. There are so many people who make my job so much easier that I'm able to simply produce, support, and distribute the awesome stuff we do.